All right. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, good morning, everybody. As Catherine just said, I'm out here in Southern California. So we're here today to talk about construction contracts 101. So let me just give you a brief little uh, galloping horse preview of who's who I am, my background, and why I'm here talking to you about construction contracts. So uh, I've been a lawyer in California for approximately 30 years. Throughout that time, I have focused on construction disputes and environmental contamination disputes. Um, I have tried approximately 40 or so cases to verdicts in arbitrations, judge trials, bench trials, um, and jury trials. So I have tried um, disputes involving construction claims in virtually every way you can do it. Uh, in fact, I'm currently actually in a trial in California right now on a construction claim case. So today's an off day for the court. So I'm here speaking with you folks. Uh, I've been a partner at three major national law firms for over 20 years. And so I've had lots of experience in construction contracts and probably most importantly for you folks, how they actually play out when you're involved in a dispute regarding them. But let's talk about uh, the construction contracts themselves and uh, things to know about it. So the next slide will tell us what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, I'm going to talk about basically the two major types of contracts, which are first prime contracts, which is prime contracts being contracts between the owner and the GC, our general contractor, sometimes referred to as a prime contract, sometimes referred to as a general contract or direct contract, same thing, different terms. So we're we'll talking about the negotiation stage, key terms, and a little bit about bonds. We could probably do a program uh, on bonds by himself, but we'll mention those as we go along. Next, uh, depending on where you are in the um, chain, so to speak, of construction, we're going to talk about subcontracts, where, which may or may not be uh, relevant, more relevant than the prime contract topic, as I said, depending on where you are in the chain. So again, negotiation, the ever popular and very, in my opinion, misused term flow down. In other words, how does the prime contract relate to or incorporate the prime contract? I'm sorry, I may have misspoke, but how the subcontract incorporates and relates to the prime contract. And I said that wrong the first time. Payment, which of course is the lifeblood of any construction project, how to get paid, how to get that cash flow in so you can pay your folks, pay your supplies, and keep on working. Um, the next topic is contract performance. Some brief issues that obviously come up during the construction stage, the actual implementing the scope of work, and some tips on how to make your performance um, be set up to, to identify issues and prepare you if you need to actually get involved in the dispute resolution process, which takes right into the last topic, which is dispute resolution. That certainly can be its own webinar itself, but we will talk about the various ways that disputes can be resolved and uh, pros and a little bit of pros and cons about, about those ways and some issues that you can expect. So, We'll move on first to the prime contracts. As I just said, I think I cut, cut, pretty much covered my own slide here with my little rambling there. But first one is the prime contract, direct contract, general contract, which is between owner and contractor. Next, sometimes called tier two contracts, which is a subcontract between the general and a sub or a supplier. And the last one is sometimes called tier three contracts, which are sub subcontracts between sub subcontractor and lower tier subcontractors and lower tier suppliers. Those are the types of contracts we're going to talk about. We're kind of probably lumped the last two together, but um, those are the major three areas. All right, so prime contract. Let's talk about negotiation. That's always the first stage. So. The reality is most, if frankly, very few public works contracts are negotiable. You will typically on prime contracts on a government job, a public works job, whether it's state or federal money, you're going to get a actual exemplar of the actual contract, including in your bid package. 
And when you submit the bid, you are agreeing to be bound to the prime contract. In other words, when you, if you are selected as the lowest responsive bidder, which is a requirement of public contracting, you will then be accepted to sign the actual contract that was included with the prime contract. So there is no negotiation. You're stuck with it. So you have to evaluate that risk when you place your bid. A couple of other things to think about when you're actually placing that bid is what are the bond requirements? All, virtually all, except for in California, for example, all public work contracts that are above $25,000 require both payment bonds and performance bonds. They also typically require a bid bond, which basically says you're going to be bound by the bid. So when you're placing a bid on a prime contract, make sure that you can meet all the bonding requirements that are, that are set forth. In other words, do you have the financial wherewithal to get a bond for the scope of work you're actually getting um, bidding on? Um, that, and I, I'd love to the next slide, but I'll cover another topic. Um, let me go back to that one. The other thing to think about, including what I just said on the bond requirements, think about your subs too, because they're going to have bond requirements that are going to flow down to them. So when you're picking your subs, and typically in a prime contract above a certain, I mean, a public works contract, excuse me, above a certain dollar level, you're going to have to designate who those subs are. Make sure you're designating a sub that, like you, can meet the bonding requirements of the contract. All right, so let's go to now to a little bit about private works. They're different. Again, I think on prime contracts, the, depending on the dollar, the, you know, the, whether, whether they are or not negotiable is probably a case-by-case -case basis and probably has mostly to do with your relationship with the private work developer or owner. Um, if they are submitting to bid, probably less of a negotiation. If it's kind of a sole source or negotiated project, as the team term implies, you're probably going to have more room. I think you're more likely to find um, greater negotiations um, positions or bargaining power if you're talking about a bigger project. A smaller project, they're just going to say, you know, take it or leave it. Example I like to give here is you walk into Bank of America and you want to get a car loan, you're going to be told you're going to sign up this document right here. If you happen to be Google and you walk in and you want $300 million loan, that's going to be a negotiation. The same kind of concept applies here in a client contract, in my experience. Um, again, so when you're bidding a job, rarely do you see the actual contract when you're bidding a private work job. It's more of a, um, you know, bid the work and then we'll work on the contract type of thing. I'm, I'm just getting typical. Of course, things can always change. Um, and you might be able to negotiate stuff after the after being awarded the bid because unlike a public works, uh, develop, um, I'm sorry, public works um, owner, developer, whatever you want to call them. Uh, a, a private private owner can certainly change the terms of the change the terms of the contract or do whatever they frankly want to do. They're not they're not subject to the contracting laws that the federal government or state governments or local governments are typically subject to. All right, so. Obviously, there's a gazillion clauses in a private contract that, that, that you should pay attention to. These things are typically very large. They typically have general conditions that go on for 30, 40, 50 pages. Um, and yeah, obviously, we're not going to talk about all of them. Here's just a couple of things that you know I see as being conditions that are routinely um, subject to dispute in prime contract situations. One is differing site condition clauses. Differing site conditions, I'm sure you folks all know, but I'll just say differing site condition is, hey, we're, we know that the contract requires us to go out here and trench. You gave me a geotechnical survey report that I relied on in terms of soil condition. And contrary to that report, there's a bunch of dang granite boulders out here that I got to deal with. That's a differing site condition. I want money. I want time. The next clause that ties right into that is you'll typically see in a lot of public contracts and a lot of private contracts, you'll see the ever popular no damage for delay clauses, which says, hey, contractor, if you get delayed for whatever reason, you are entitled to a time extension, but there is no damages. Interestingly enough, that clause is also kind of the corollary of that is a flip clause 
which says that if the contractor delays the owner, then the contractor is liable for damages. So, again, if you're talking public work, these things are probably not negotiable, so you've got to assess the risk before you sign these contracts. Five warranty clauses, um, and we'll talk about whether some of these are, in fact, illegal in some states, but let me talk about what implied warranty contract says. It says, implied warranty contract clause says, look, we're going to give you a bunch of plans and specs, but you know what? We're not guaranteeing they're good. They might be a bunch of junk. And if they're bad, that's on you, contractor. Another clause to consider when you're signing up things. Liquidated damages. These can be big bucks. Um, so typically that, that clause, those clauses are, you don't finish your scope of work, your south, you use a construction lingo term, by a certain fixed period of time set forth in the contract, you are liable for liquidated damages at a fixed dollar amount. Um, again, so that's something to think about when you're looking at, do I really want to take the risk of this contract? Um, there we go. All right, so just this is just an example of a different site condition. Uh, I don't need to read it. It kind of it kind of goes through. You'll see this in a lot of contracts. Contractor represents it as inspected, yada, yada, yada. I'm taking the risk as the contractor of unforeseen risks, hazards, and difficulty. And even stuff in the subsurface that there's no dang way I can figure out, right? So you're buying that. Um, you know, all these clauses, I'll say, uh, you know, you might be able to, if you actually got to dispute, there might be some arguments, but these are clauses you're going to have to deal with. Um, I don't know if the next slide deals with this, but I'll tell you another thing to be concerned about here is there's going to be a notice provision in all these contracts that says if you did encounter certain conditions, you've got a certain period of time to, to, to provide notice. Um, I think we get into detail about that a few slides later. All right, so public works owners might not be able to shift responsibility for differing site condition onto the general contractor. For example, California Public Contract Code Section 7104 makes those illegal in California. I don't know about other states. I know about California. Public private contractors should try to limit scope of responsibility. If you've got any ability to negotiate, try to limit it with clauses such as, you know, um, I, I'm relying on what's in the bid documents. I'm relying on what's in the geotechnical survey, sometimes referred to as a GDSR, or reasonably observable during a site visit. You know, the, the topic of that last bullet there was public-private. Obviously, on a private work, you're going to have a much better idea that you can negotiate that, uh, or much more likely that you can negotiate that clause. No damages for, for delay. So this is, uh, I, you know, obviously, Grace, we talked about it a second, but here's an example of the clause. An extension of time for contractor's completion of the work shall be contractor's sole remedy for delay. So... The owner's going to take the position that it doesn't really matter what the heck happens. Um, they could, you know, delay the project, clearly delay the project. They could fail to give you power to the site. It could be, you know, all kinds of things. They could decide that, you know, we're not going to build a two-story building. We're going to build an eight-story building. And, hey, you know what, buddy contractor? You're going to build it. And it takes you longer. That's your tough luck. Um, so let's talk about what to do with those clauses. So, again, California's going to help you out here. So, California Public Contract Code 7102 says that's invalid on public projects. Let's see, you have to check your own state and see your if it's valid on your state for those clauses. If it's not, if it's just, if it's, if it's a clause that's not invalid, if, we're, if you've got, you've got arguments. The way these clauses really work out, if you look at the case law, is you got to figure out what the facts are and whether there's really an equity situation that that comes into play here that makes it unreasonable and unjust to enforce the clause. My example of going from a two-story structure to an eight-story structure, I think, would fit within that clause. If you've got a project and there are, you know, 150 design changes and your price to complete goes from, you know, practically double you've got a really good argument that that clause is invalid. Big picture concept for me is that in all the cases, whether it's a judge, it's a jury, it's an arbitrator, at some level, there is a decision that is made by those folks who is right, who is wrong, who is the good guy, who's the bad guy. I like to say in a large times, 
They're morality plays. And they pick the good guy, they pick the bad guy, and they do right by the good guy, and they screw the bad guy. You got to be on the right side. It's going to be very fact dependent if you're going to try to get out of that no damage for delay clause. Uh, all right. So this is one I covered briefly a little while ago. So this is the typical clause. Owner disclaims any warranty express or implies the contract on blah, blah, blah. Specs are or will be accurate, consistent, or constructible. In other words, these, we'll give you these documents, but geez, I don't know. I don't know if they're any good. Um, so, California, once again, is going to say that is not valid. California Public Contract Code, the section by site, will say that that is not valid. Public works, private works job, I think you have a, a you're, you know, let's just talk about something. Try to negotiate something like that up front out of the contract if you're dealing with all these clauses that are bad. If you're on public private work and you can negotiate, try to get them out of there. Uh, if you're faced with having to deal with them and you, they're in there, you, you know, you've got arguments. It's really, like I say here, you didn't hire the con, you didn't hire the designer, you didn't hire the engineer. So it really should be the owner that should be on the hook for that. So that's where the equity concept comes into play. But it's much better off to deal with it up front and get it out of the contract rather than having to hire somebody like me to go fight that thing for you. Uh, liquidated damages is the last one we're going to cover. Like I said, there's a lot more clauses we could talk about, but you know we're trying to limit it to some of the ones that, that are probably most problematic. All right, so like I said, this is typically how this works is contractor has a fixed period of time to do its scope of work or sal if they shortened it there um and um you know just hypothetically you got 90 days to complete this project the the scope of work if you don't complete it by x time you will be subject to dollar a day penalty um that's probably non-negotiable it's probably non-negotiable on both public and private works the reason i say that is Typically, those clauses exist because they are tied into some other contract. For example, I've done litigation about power plant projects, and the contractor, the owner, has made a deal with the, or the owner or developer has made a deal with the, with the public utility that we're going to bring you X kilowatts of power by X date, and they're subject to penalties. So that's why they're sometimes not negotiable on, on either both private or public works jobs. Again, you know, here's these are clauses that you might be able to, you, if you can negotiate them out, you should try to do that. Or if you can try to limit them. It might be possible to challenge if you have to if, after the project or if you're subject to dispute resolution provision. The way you do that is there are requirements to how much liquidated damages are and whether it's fair. You know, you can argue about whether you're actually the cause of the delay or whether you have some reason that you were delayed that's not your fault, if you can blame on someone else. You might be able to also challenge the liquidated damage concept itself in terms of it being invalid. In California, for example, Liquidated damages are only available if it is difficult or impossible to assess actual, actual damages and the liquidated damages provision um, bear reasonable uh, or reasonably based on what actual damages might be. In other words, they're in the ballpark. So, for example, if you've got, let's just say, you've got a $1 million scope of work contract and the penalties are $500,000 a day, that's probably not a reasonable liquidated damage clause. But again, you know, try to negotiate it out if you can. If you can, get there's some arguments you can make. Final thing on that is you really should, if you can't negotiate it out, you got to analyze the risk at time of bit. You know, construction at risk, there's a reason why there's, you know, people do it, and there's a reason why people lose their, lose their shirts doing it. So all risk needs to be taken advantage, taken into consideration when you're making a bid. Um, let me grab some water here and then we'll go to the next slide. All right, so prime subcontractor performance is so obviously prime contractor assumes responsibility for sub performance. So when you're talking about the owner, the owner is going to say, hey, 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 that's a uh, 
Part of this work is not good. Part of that work is effective. The electrical is late. The general contractor can't say, oh, well, hey, I didn't do the electrical. Why are you talking to me? He or she or it, whatever you want to say, is on the hook for the sub just by the little they did the work. And obviously, most of us know that general contractor, unless you're talking heavy civil, where there is some sub performance, most general contractors don't actually do any physical work on the site. Um, so here's another thing. So what, what all that first point ties into is you've got to make sure that if you're taking on a project where there's substantial risk of performance in terms of penalties, in terms of you know no damage or delays, and a lot of clauses that can come back to bite a contractor, when you're making a bid as a GC, you've got to consider, can my subs, can I rely on my subs to perform? So there's a couple ways to help you out here. You can't consider bonding, bonding back to your sub, which means you get a bond in your favor on the on the subcontractor. There's also something a little bit newer, not not really newer, much newer, but it's something called subcontractor default insurance. We we'll talk about another webinar on that in the well, but essentially similar to a bond. But the advantage is in, in a bond, the bonding company or surety decides that there's actually a default and a subcontractor default insurance policy. The contractor decides that the subcontractor is in default. But once they do that, they run the risk that ultimately the insurer will not agree with that decision. So that's a, a topic we can go into much more depth, but we'll, that, 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 that'll kind of hit the highlights for now. Um, so just because, just, just to, real briefly, and again, you folks probably know, payment performance bonds uh, protect you in the event some contractor defaults, fails to pay workers. So when you're thinking about a payment bond, that is a bond that is there for a sub that says that if he, or a buyer that says if he doesn't get paid, he can go to the bond. Performance bond basically deals with if the contractor or subcontractor doesn't, doesn't finish the job, doesn't, is, is in default. And then the bonding company takes over because responsible for the completion of the project. They hire the placement contractors. They can take over the project. There's a variety of remedies that a bonding company can take. If you're going to do that, if you're going to bond back your sub, you're obviously buying yourself some protection. Or if you if you decide to get that sub subcontract default insurance or SDI, it's commonly referred to, make sure you're putting the cost of that stuff in your bid price because you're going to be on the hook for that. Unlike the, you know, you're not going to blatantly say that, oh, I'm going to add to my contract later. You're going to have to build it in. Uh, all right, next slide. All right, so this is the term flow down, and it's more general than I've just stated here, but some a lot of prime contracts and some subcontracts say this term, which I, I don't really understand what it means because I think it's very vague. Um, and I think that if you, that if the clause is used, that if you're seeing a negotiation, you should try to negotiate it and get more specificity on it. But like this one, this type, let me just say what the clause is I'm talking about. Many contracts say the prime contract flows down to the subs as the prime contractor flows to the owner or worse to that effect. Basically means that the terms of the prime contract Flow down to the subcontractor, so they've got to perform as if the subcon prime contract was part of the subcontract. Problem is that term flow down, and there's terms that kind of mean the same thing. It's very hard to figure out exactly what is flowing down. So I would recommend that if you're talking about and you have the ability to negotiate this, you specifically identify what parts of a contract are in the subcontract. Because I'll tell you, if you go to court and you're going to argue about this. That clause, it flows down to the same extent it flows to the owner, is completely vague and meaningless. You know, remember, if you're in a court, you're talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about construction. So I'll tell you right now, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm in trial right now and doesn't know a thing about construction. And frankly, it's like talking Greek. It's a whole different world that is very foreign to most people. So the way you the, the, the make, make, try to make your contracts, and this is a general overriding concept, if you have the ability to negotiate or if you're drafting contracts, try to make it as clear as possible. Don't rely on, hey, the subcontractor or that guy knows what I'm talking about. Because ultimately, if you're in a dispute, you're going to have to convince somebody that's not in the industry at in all likelihood. So think about that. Basically, 
make it make it so a lay person. I know that's a pain, but try to make it as simple as possible so that anyone can understand. Uh, all right, so this is the last bullet point here is bid time. Make sure that you know the bonding requirements and the insurance requirements. Uh, your your subcontractor can deal with them um, before you place them on your uh, include them on your in your bid. Uh, blah blah blah. So unfortunately, I've got a little thing here in the middle of that clause. But here's basically the clause, the flow down clause of the type I was thinking, I was I was mentioning. And like I said, if I, if I could figure out how to get this thing out, I can't. Stop. Now I'm in trouble. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> my technical wizardry is uh, on full display here. Um, but that's the typical flow down clause. Subcontractors will be bound to prime contractor to the same extent that prime contractor is bound to owner under the prime contract. I frankly don't know what that means. And I will tell you that I don't know what a judge means. So the extent you can negotiate, try to nail down what that means. So in other words, try to say, look, what parts of the prime contract is are I responsible for? What parts of them flow down? And then list those parts and say, those are incorporated into the contract. This section here about whatever that means, that first sentence, I think is subject to interpretation and is vague and it's just to me, it's unfortunate how many times it, that's in contracts and yeah, and it's just not described. So I think that's something to be aware of when you're negotiating contracts. Um, look, and the last point is, you know, seems kind of self obvious, self seems kind of intuitive, but if you're a subcontractor and you're being asked to be bound to a prime contract, you need to see the prime contract. Lots of times in, in construction projects, the sub never sees the prime contract. If it's got a clause like the slowdown clause, which a lot of them do, you need to see the prime contract. Uh, all right, so on to, on to uh, subcontract key. We're on the key subcontract. We went to a whole other section. We're on key subcontract issues. So the first one, obviously, is scope and price. So if you are looking to you know, make sure that Regardless of your general contractor or the subcontractor, make sure that what's going on here in terms of what the scope of work is and what's included or excluded in the price is uh, is, is clearly stated. Don't just say, for example, um, subcontractor is going to do plumbing scope. That, that's that's too vague. Make sure you're attack you're saying subcontractor will perform the following scope of work in accordance with the contract documents. And I would state. If possible, subcontractor will do the plumbing work shown on sheets, you know, P1 through 8. The subcontractor will perform the plumbing scheme in accordance with the plumbing specifications, you know, 605 through 802. They are attached here too. The key and all, you know, the, the, if you can make your contract as clear as possible, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay dividends in the long run. Um, that's my final bullet point. I just covered it. Um, um, so, you know, um, this is, this is a big issue in construction projects. So schedule, obviously. Subcontractor will still provide contractor with scheduling information and proposed schedule or performance of a work and inform and date acceptable to contractor. Subcontractor, here's the one I probably should highlight. Subcontractor shall conform to contractor's project schedule and all revisions or changes made there to this, that clause right there is a clause I have litigated about or similar ones many times. And this gets into the situation, what is the contractor schedule and can the contractor just keep on changing the schedule and making jump through hoops? The answer in my opinion is no, but the way if you could, you know, try to limit this to, you know, I'm only going to comply with the contract schedule attached to the contract at the time of bid, unless there's a change order or something like that, it's in, your, it's in your interest to do that. If you can't, then you're going to have to document. You have to document, document, document. You're going to have to document, hey, this is changing. This is changing my schedule. This is going to impact. Your schedule is not accurate. Um, like I said, you can try to limit where you need to document during the project and make these things clear up front. It's going to pay dividends for you. Uh, all right, so this gets into the next situation and kind of ties into my document, document, document comment. 
So virtually all subcontracts are going to have to set provisions that say you're going to have to give prompt notice of schedule delay. You're going to have to give prompt notice of change conditions. You're going to have to give prompt notice of any condition you encounter that thinks you're going to have seek extra compensation, more money, or more dollars, or more time. So here's a substantial clause, similar to the typical clause that's going to say that. Should subcontractor be substantially delayed in the prosecution and completion of the work, subcontractor shall within five calendar days from the beginning of the delay, notify prime contract manager of writing of the cause of delay. Last but one, give notice of potential delay as soon as possible, even if scope of delay or quantum or cost of impact is not known, better to over notice. You know, one thing that in my experience of litigation, the big general contractors are much better at papering the file than subcontractors are. They've got the resources to do it, and they've got people sitting back in their office, you know, hey, sub, you're not doing this. Hey, sub, you're behind. All this type of stuff. The extent that you can match them on that game, or not a game, and that prudent course of conduct, to be correct about it, the better you're going to be. So if you if you come across something, like my example way back from when about, you know, we we're supposed to have sandy soil and regular soil, and I'm having a bunch of boulders, when you hit those boulders, tell them, hey, we just hit boulder. That's a different site condition. That is going to impact us. We are going to be delayed by this. We will identify later the quantum of that or the cost or the cost or the amount of the delay. But get your notice as soon as possible about that. Hey, this is a problem. We are going to have an issue. Try to meet this five calendar day thing as best you can. You know, again, if you go to litigation, if you didn't do it in five days, can you get around it? Probably. Particularly if, hey, everybody knows that this was an issue. I've told everybody, but don't don't rely on, you know, I told Johnny when we were out when we were out in the trailer about this. At the very least, send Johnny an email saying, hey, Johnny, I hit, I hit boulders. That's going to cause a delay. I'm figuring out how much. I won't know for sure until later, but it's definitely going to be a problem. All right, so we just talked about liquidated damages uh, a while ago. They almost always slow down. So this is just a typical clause. So. Like I said, if you can negotiate them out or if you can negotiate them limits on it, uh, you know, better off you're going to be. Uh, I don't know how, you know, it's, whether you're going to be able to do that, it's going to be case specific. Um, you know, obviously, even in the public works contest, uh, in the public work context, while prime contracts are almost never negotiable, subs are not really subject to that. So there's probably is more room for a sub to negotiate even on a even on a public works project, than, than there is for a prime a contractor to negotiate with a public agency. The other thing to be considered about is indemnity clauses. Oh, virtually every subcontract is going to have a huge broad indemnity clause. It's probably a similar one on the prime contract too, which basically says it just you know we can read it i don't need to read it but it basically says you're you're on the hook for virtually everything whatever goes wrong in that project these clauses are designed to make it so the, the general contractor can basically wash his hands of everything say hey there's a problem it's your problem so um so there are some limits by law there's are some limits ultimately that you're going to have to uh that you can assert just in terms of going back to a concept of equity that we talked about early. But again, if you can try and negotiate these clause and limit it, you're going to be better off. Um, some of these clauses are so broad that the law does help you out. So I think that's the next one. So some of these clauses are too broad. Like for example, um, in California, you can't, you can't, um, um, you can't, as general contractor, you cannot require a sub to identify, indemnify a general contractor for the general contractor's active negligence or willful misconduct. I guess that there's other statutes in other states that would that would that would provide that as well. Um, you know, some that we, it just depends. Again, if the, the equity concept does come into play if you're going to go to the litigation on this, but 
you know, it's going to be a problem, and particularly it's going to be a problem in terms of the defense obligation. So how that would work is, let's just say the GC gets sued by the owner for whatever, um, delay, for construction defect, anything. First thing they're going to do is they're going to send out notice to all their subcontractors and say, hey, we got this lawsuit or we got this claim. Here's our here's our demand that you defend and indemnify. So defend, again, you probably know this, but defend means you're going to fight that thing and you're going to pay for my lawyers or you're going to bring in lawyers to, to fight it for me. Indemnity means, hey, if I get hit with money or damages, you're going to pay the money, not me. You know, like I said, we can try to deal with this later, but you should try to try to deal with it up front much better. Try to can if you if you either negotiate it out or definitely consider the indemnity risk when you make the bid and decide, hey, is this risk is this risk of problems on this project? Am I really putting myself too far out by agreeing to this? So, um, you know, bids are more than just what's the price, what's the scope. You gotta consider a lot of a lot of things when you're making up when you're making a bid in order to make sure you're not not you know in a hole and in a problem later down the road. Uh, so another one that's good to think of mind are these change order request clauses. They're all gonna have change order requests, things which are basic, very similar to very similar to what we just talked about. They're gonna say, you know, if you, you identify anything that, that you think is a change, anything that you think that requires more time or more money, you're gonna to have to notify the general contractor within a very short period of time, typically. Five days is really pretty common. The other thing to think about when you're looking at a change order uh, request or a change order provision is does it talk about markup? Lots of these, lots of contracts, Limit markup. So if your markup, if you're trying to mark up a job and you would typically mark it up 15%, hypothetically, there may be a clause in that contract that says change order requests get marked up at 5%, something of like that nature. Um, so you should take that into consideration. Again, if you can negotiate it, great. If not, you got to think about it when you're making when you're making your bid. Um, also, another clause to keep in mind is. Um, they, virtually all contractors are going to say this, if a change order request is disputed, subcontractor will perform the disputed work, right? So the last thing, and trust me, this is, I've dealt with this too many times, change order request and the subcontractor says he's not going to do it, that is going to be a problem. That is going to be a huge problem. That is particularly if you're dealing, if you happen to present this claim, in a forum with experienced construction personnel, that's going to be a problem. That is that is very just very uh, much disfavored to not do the work, um, and it can really really cause big problems for you. So let's uh, look for that clause. Assume you're going to have to do it and, and do the work under protest. If you're in that spot, problem is that you run into on this thing is again the document 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 problem. A lot of subcontractors just say, oh, well, I incurred a much more money on the project and some of it or part of it or a lot of it due to this change order. Not really going to be good enough. You're going to have to identify the specific work that was the change order work and how much and, and why and how you include it. Because ultimately, you have to prove that your change order request work was done for the change order and that the costs you incurred were reasonable for that. So. You're going to dispute the work. First, you reserve all claims. Hey, we have encountered XYZ problem. This is a change. You have refused our change order. We will perform this work under protest. We reserve all claims. And then to the best you can, try to track your costs separately for that change order work. I've even been on projects where if it's a big enough change order, the contractor will actually put people with different colored vests on the site and doing change order work and say, all the guys in red vests are doing change order work and you track them separately. That the better you can separate out the costs, the better you're gonna be in the long run if you have to fight about it. And probably are, we've already just used your change order request. Uh, all right, so here's here's a, just another, this is basically a change order clause and giving notice of the clause. Five days, like I said, seems to be the most popular five period of, in these clauses. Uh, but basically, says you don't give me notice and you don't get, you know, don't get blah, 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 jump through X, Y, Z hoops. You're not going to give me money. You're not going to give me time. Um, all right. 
Then we'll, let's talk about payment. Let's talk about how we get paid. Look up the terms of what's what is required, what you're gonna need to do to get money if you're a sub. It's a public works project, a federal project, you're gonna have to give certified payroll reports. You know, they're required. I imagine a lot of states they're certainly required in California public projects, they're certainly required under the federal acquisition regulations on federal projects. Certified payroll records are you know certified under penalty of perjury. Um, and they should be right, they should be accurate. And the big problem is that they're not including criminal prosecution. Uh, and they are kind of, you know, they're known as basically the Bible in terms of what was the labor cost on a project and who did what. Um, lean releases, this is basically, uh, you're gonna have to give lean releases for your lower tier subs, your suppliers. Um, I'm, I'm just identifying conditions that the contract's gonna say. Union all clear letters, basically, a letter from the union saying if it's our union job that you know all union dues have been paid, blah blah blah. Final thing to think about so that's the first three bullets were things that you're gonna that are probably in a contract that you're gonna have to file with before the uh, GC has to pay you. The other thing to think about is look at the Prompt Pay Act. Prompt Pay California has a statute that requires applies both public work and private work. It says if you get money for if if the contractor or a subcontractor gets money for for the for the work of a lower tier server supplier, they've got a certain amount of time to pay that person, or they're going to be hit with penalties. California's two percent interest per month, which adds up quite quickly. So think about that when you're processing payment where where you are. All right, let's talk briefly. A lot of contracts have pay if paid, paid when paid, those types of things. Um, so pay if paid is illegal in some states. It's illegal in California. Uh, pay when paid, pay if paid, by the way, is legal in some states. I believe it's legal in Georgia. No, I'm sorry, I may be wrong about that. It's legal in some states. Pay if paid is illegal in a lot of states. California is illegal. Pay when paid, um, that I believe is legal. It's legal in California probably legal in most states, with the caveat that in California, pay when paid means there's a reasonable period. So in other words, yes, it's okay for the contract to say, well, we, the, G, the GC will pay the sub within X days after the GC gets paid from the owner. There is a reasonable period when, if that doesn't happen, that the sub still has to pay the lower tier sub. Um, so, and I, you know, I, I, like I said, I know California law much better than, I obviously don't know many states' laws in California. Um, just something to look at, something to be aware of. All right, talking about payments, let's talk about how you get paid. So um, look, let's talk about subcontractors and lien rights, right? Yeah, you don't have lien rights on public works, but you do have lien rights on private works. I'm sure pretty much in the Audrey states you do. California certainly do. But in order to protect the process to have lien rights, you got to step through the statutory requirements. The first one being on a project is you got to give preliminary notice to the owner and the general contractor. A lien is your ability, even though you're not in privity of contract, you don't have a contract with the owner, it gives you the right to put a lien on the owner's property. But in order to do that, you have to perfect that lien or under the terms of the statutes in your particular state. Um, you know, we can have another discussion about all of these things for more than an hour, but generally you're gonna have to, within a very short period of time after going on the project, there's ways around this, but the prudent course is in California within 20 days of bringing stuff to the project, you give notice, a lien, you get place notice, you know, so it's a preliminary notice or a 20 day notice or various names, but you want to give notice in accordance with the statute of your claim on that uh, claim to lien rights on that property. Um, some projects uh, also have this, there are no lien rights in public work projects. Like I said, you obviously can't go placing a lien on the United States military base, and you can't go place a lien on the White House. So public works contracts, uh, like I said, in California, anything over 25 grand, and I forget the cop and federal projects, but there, there's similar requirements there. They're gonna have to, they're gonna have a payment bond. And what a payment bond does is it basically gives you the, it takes the place of a lien 
So if you're if you did not get paid on a timely basis by whoever owed you money, the GC or a sub, if you're a lower tier subcontractor, the payment bond steps in and gives you the right to right to sue the bond company and the person that posted the bond, typically a GC or a higher GC or tier sub. These things are very, very powerful. In California, there is very limited defenses to a payment bond claim. Basically, if you brought work, brought goods or services to a project and it was actually incorporated in that project and you're not paid within the contract time period, regardless of whether it's change order work or regardless of whether it's disputed change order work, you may assert a payment bond claim against the surety. It's a big hammer and it's, I think, in practice, it's underused. Um, so consider that. Consider if you've got a payment bond, consider that you've got a hammer and consider whether to use it or not. Uh, once again, I, I mentioned it briefly, but there's prompt pay laws you got to think about. If you're getting paid and you've got money that you got paid for a lower tier sum, you better think about passing it on in seven days or whatever time period applies in your state. Otherwise, you're going to be subject to some penalties uh, or could be subject to penalties. Um, let's see where we are here. Slow down. I'm, I'm, uh, This is just some um, um, some more clauses to think about when you're a subcontractor. A lot of times, you know, let's, let's just figure out up front who's responsible for getting permits. Um, typically, that's the DC that's responsibility, and you probably assume that if you're a subcontractor, but watch out. Some contracts do require the subcontractor to do that. Again, if you can negotiate it out, great. If not, um, you know. Back to the name when you're making your bid. Uh, basically, you know, what I've said in, about claims provisions, they, the notice provisions, they apply to the prime contractor, they apply to the subcontractor. Um, you got to be aware of them and, and, and you got to try to comply with them as best you can. Like I said, giving what the contractor or owner would call effective notice because it doesn't state how much time or how much cost is involved in the notice. Giving a notice that doesn't provide those details is way better than no notice at all. That's that's the key from my perspective. Uh, so yeah, so claims, as probably everybody knows, you got money, you got time, or you got both. So you know, make sure you're covering when you're submitting a claim. If you're only asking for money, Let's just say hypothetically, you submit a change order request. If you're if you don't know how much time you want, don't submit a change order claim or a notice or anything that says or a change order request that says, "Hey, I want twenty five bucks for hitting that rock." If you're don't say anything about time, there's going to be an argument that if you don't want time. So if you want time, if you don't know how much time, when you send a claim in, say, "I want twenty five bucks." We are evaluating the time impact of this condition. We reserve our rights to assert time once that has been determined. You know, particularly if you're dealing with a contract that's got liquidated damages, time is often just as much as is important. Preserving time and getting time extension just as important as getting money for the change condition. All right, so I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a project site and been asked to ask for the project team, hey. What is the change order uh, notice period on this project? When do you have to give notice of a di different site condition? What's the contract say? And they say, I don't know. I've never seen the contract. So, th so this contract performance tip is, you know, the contracts, they're all, unless it's a very simple project, most contracts are very detailed and very long. And frankly, uh, it's it, unrealistic to dispense that most project executives or project field teams are going to read it. So try to shorten it down. Try to give the highlights, as I say, a little a little bullet point that you can hand out to people that we should know. Hey, here's our schedule. Hey, if you encounter different site conditions, you've got you know five days to tell people. A little bullet point thing that everybody knows what to do. You know, you can give that. Um, you can you know make sure everybody's on board with what the contract says, at least the key provisions of the contract, and maybe make a little something they can send out to the field so that everybody's on board with what to do. Um, next bullet point in terms of contract performance, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. 
You know, the idea that, hey, I had lunch with Johnny and I told him in the trailer or whatever or over a beer that, you know, we, we're, 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 you know, we're having problems because we're getting delayed because the electrical stuff's not doing X, Y, or Z. Put that in writing. Um, make sure that everything is documented. If they're responding late to RFIs, put that in the file. Say, hey, we're out here putting on our thumbs because, you know, your dang architect won't respond to our RFI. Got no site power. You know, we can go on and on and on with all kinds of examples. But if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. Make sure, you know, win the document game. Win the document game. I know it's a pain. I know that a lot of subs don't have the staff to do it. But the extent, it's very important. And the extent that you're going to, you know, in my view, you know, the best way to avoid being in a long-term or heavily litigated dispute is to assume up front that you have to be, that you will be the one and prepare yourself. Kind of like a Boy Scout model, right? Be prepared or whatever it is. Same thing applies to contracts. The more you assume, the more you prepare to fight, the more you're, the more you're going to be in, in a position to fight if you have to. Um, they, daily reports are really critical. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be used to, to for or against you um, in, in the litigation. If you're saying, you know, we couldn't do that work because we were delayed by the, you know, that that drywall wouldn't hang the wouldn't hang the uh, wouldn't hang the uh, the sheetrock, and so we couldn't paint the thing. You know, if there's not an explanation as to why you're not doing the work, then um, then that's going to be a problem. In right, excuse me. Uh, default default termination. You know, obviously nobody wants to hear about this, but that's the uh, you know this is you know if you deal with that uh, situation. Try to see if you can cure during the cure period. If not, document why it's not, why it's not, why you're not able to cure, why you're not, why it's not a default, why you're not able to cure the time period. Um, there's not a ton more to say about that. The one thing I will add to that is the failure to man work. So, or failure to prosecute work. If that's what the default is, if you dispute that the level of work or manpower or resources you're bringing to the site that the contractor is putting you in default because you are below what, what the contractor is saying is the resources required. The solution to that is to continue on site with the resources that you believe is adequate according to your schedule and your expectation of the work. The solution to that is not to say, I'm not going to man up, um, I'm not going to do that. You don't have to man up to what the general contractor asks for necessarily if you believe it's excessive, but you should keep men resources on site that meets what you can arguably say is your foreseeable requirements at the time. Because that's, like I said, the, the, the worst thing to do is to leave the job and not perform the work. Termination of convenience, um, you know, a lot of contracts have these. Just be aware when you're bidding, uh, bidding your projects, whether or not, what the terminations are for convenience are. Sometimes, you know, it's pretty easy for someone to terminate for convenience. The thing that's critical is the highlighted portion below, which is the, what, what you get if there is a termination for convenience. This one has a reasonable sum for overhead and profit. That's fairly typical. The, the, you know, what this clause is doing is it's taking away the right to get profit for completion of the work. So just bear that when you're negotiating a contract, bidding or look at what, what, what the default provision says, look at the cure periods, look at if they can terminate for convenience and what you get if that happens. Um, all right. All right, I think we're getting close here to the end, and I'll just be obviously just be resolution could be you know maybe a day that uh, situation here. So um, let's just go through it quickly. So a lot of times it's become kind of a norm; it's a new thing to do that a lot of contracts have a clause that says before we engage in arbitration or litigation, um, the parties will attempt in a good faith effort to mediate the dispute. So my next question is, is that enforceable? And the question is, I mean, if, if, if you don't mediate, um, is an judge an arbitrator going to say, yeah, no, no, you can't sue, you can't go to arbitration because you've got to go to mediation? Uh, my, my view on that is maybe, maybe not. It's very judge-dependent and hard to guess. But the reality is, and let's talk about mediation in general, 
mediation before formal dispute process, it's a great goal, it's a great concept. I have no problem with the thought. The reality is, is that mediations only work if both parties are willing to accept some degree of compromise. Can't go into mediation or any settlement negotiation and expect you're going to get hundred cents on the dollar. The law of the other side give you hundred cents on the dollar. In contrast, if you are the party that's being asked to pay money, can't go in there expecting to have the guy say, oh yeah, I'll take zero. You're right, buddy. Not going to work. There's usually a compromise needs to happen. And sometimes that compromise, people aren't in a situation where they're ready to compromise early on in the project. They need more documents. They need more facts. They need more, practically, the hassle of being in litigation to make them in the right mood to, to solve the situation. So there are a lot of them go, are they enforceable? I don't know. I'm not saying they're not a good, they're not a good thought process. I'm just saying sometimes they're effective, sometimes they're not. Next thing is arbitration versus litigation. I've done them both ways, lots of ways. I'll tell you the one thing I would say is that arbitration or, or a bench trial is, in, is with, in my experience, significantly preferable to a jury. A jury, if you just think, I mean, when you're litigating for a judge, you're dealing with someone that doesn't know construction, it's much easier to put on a case in front of experienced construction arbitrators who know the lingo, so you don't have to go through everything, like what the change order request, what's, you know, whatever. There's a million things that we can think about in the construction industry that are really terms of art that people in the industry speak like they're just talking, you know, out of hand, which are very foreign to, the, to, to most people. One thing I will say about juries is that a pre-dispute jury waiver is illegal in some states. It's illegal in California. So you, there's a lot of contracts that say this, is that we'll agree that this would be able to handle in the Superior Court of Los Angeles County. Both sides agree to waive jury. That's illegal in California. What's not illegal is that after a dispute happens, you can decide how you want, the parties after a dispute happens can decide however they want to decide their dispute. In other words, if there's an arbitration clause in a contract, and after you guys have initiated arbitration, go off that process, and you say, you know what? We don't want to go to arbitration. We want to go to litigation. Do you both agree? Fine. The same thing is true in the reverse. Frankly, if you ensure litigation or arbitration and you decide, let's go out and, you know, draw straws, fine. Whatever you want to do, that's fine. Once you're in the dispute, you basically control your own destiny. Arbitration versus litigation, just real quickly, a lot of times people say, wait a minute, arbitration, what I don't like about that is there's essentially no appeal rights. Very hard to appeal an arbitration decision. That's true. It's also true that the arbitrator, at least in California, can get the facts law wrong, the law wrong, and there's no appeal from it. You're stuck with it. That's obviously not good. What the pro of that is, obviously, the pro of that is it ends. There is no appeal. You're basically stuck with the situation. Litigation does have the advantage that you can appeal. But as a practical matter, if there are findings of fact made in the litigation process, in other words, yes, that was in the scope of work, or no, that was not in the scope of work, it's going to be very hard for the public court to, to overturn that. If it's an issue of law, you have a much better shot of getting, getting, that, uh, getting that overturned. In other words, issue of law being like, for example, um, the delay clause is, 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 is not enforceable, something of that nature. But, you know, so arbitration has its pros. You know, to, to great advantage of arbitration is that you control the arbitrator, you select it, and you decide when and where the arbitration is going to happen. Largely, litigation is pretty much a crapshoot. But, you know, like I said, there's pros and cons in both ways to go. The last thing I'm going to talk about, I believe, is prevailing parties' currency provision. So there will be blood. Um, if you're deciding whether you want an attorney's fees provision, think about this. There will be blood means that. Litigation is incredibly expensive. It just is. It's uh, one of my former partners used to call it the blood sport of the rich. And what that means is if you're thinking about an attorney's fee provision, if you are the big guy, if you think you're going to have more financial wherewithal uh, than, the, than the party you're going to be in dispute with, you probably do not want an attorney's fee provision. The reason for that is if you, because then you can flood in the other side, frankly, by having more, more attorneys throwing more things at the smaller guy, so that you basically beat him up through a war of attrition. 
If there's an attorney fee provision, that smaller guy may be willing to engage in that process. If he thinks he's an upside, he can get the attorney fees back. So maybe it's somewhat counterintuitive, but think about who benefits if you're negotiating a contract or if you're deciding whether attorney fee provision should be in a contract. Think about that dynamic. And let's see. I think that's the end. Maybe I'm on the wrong side. Thank you. No, that's it. it looks oh, good. Questions on my last slide. Yes. Um, here we go, though. For the attorneys, you can go one back mark for a second. Um, sure. Attorneys, you will get this information in an email as well with the follow up email that's coming Friday. But right there on the screen, if you are an attorney licensed in California, Florida, or Texas, there are special instructions for you. Especially Texas, you need to send an email to me, Catherine.Barona at levelset.com with your state bar number. And all other states, you're going to self report to your state bar. So check with them for the instructions. And Mark, we do have several questions. Um, are you able to. Go back the question slide. Um, are you able to pull up that QA box at the end, at the bottom of your Zoom screen? That's where the questions are typed in. Yeah, but I can't read them. So okay, um, well I'll read them off. So um, wait a minute, there's like thirty questions. Well, there's okay, there's eighteen, but I was going to tell people we don't have time to get to all of these. Um, we're going to hang on for however many Mark can get to. But if you, would I, like I will. That's fine, Kevin. I will say my. My contact information yeah. is on stage. If you guys want to send me an email, I'll yeah. be happy to happy to answer questions. But go ahead. Sorry. Sounds good. Um, first one from at 120 was what about the Sparin doctrine on defects and inefficiencies in the plans and contract documents? Uh Spearing, you know, I, I don't know if the sphere does apply, but Spearing basically the case that talks about what kind of cost and damage you can get and how you deal with deficiencies. It also is most notably cited for the proposition about how you get investigation costs. Um, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but yeah, Spear Doctrine applies in California. Okay. Um, next question. Does Great Western Drywall versus Rural Construction serve as a good precedent for not equally spreading back charges or LDs? That's it. Yeah, I, I guess I'll answer it this way. Um, I, I think ultimately, if you get into speed about who's responsible for back charges or LDs, Contract provisions that talk about splitting them equally or something of that nature are you can probably defeat because when you think about how it plays out, really, you're probably going to have cross claims that go back and forth, and there's going to be a finding of who does what. Now, that's probably not a very likely situation in terms of actually litigating about that, but um, but my answer would be that I, I think that you're actually going to be able to talk more about equity again in terms of how that's dealt with. Um, next question is, <clears throat> most flow down clauses is usually a one-way conduit. Should we fight for the same rights, remedies, and redress towards the contractor that the contractor has with the owner? <laughs> the answer to that question is, sure. The, 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 I think it's a, so first of all, yeah. You're right. The flow down provision used typically is kind of a one way street. And basically, the contractor decides what provisions he thinks are helpful, but he can flow down to the sub. So, would it be ideal if we could have a reverse concept? Sure. Um, whether you can negotiate that or not, I don't know. For example, like you know, the damage for delay clause, I mentioned that a lot of them say there's no damages for delay for a subcontractor, but in turn, the subcontractor is responsible for any delay. That he causes, um, um, then that the owner hits the contractor with. So, sure, it would be better if you could make it a two way street. Um, I just don't know if you're going to be successful doing that. 
All right, thank you. Um, Julie asked, how successful have you been at negotiating out LDs and how are you handling anti-indemnity states? So the answer to that, negotiating out LDs, I would say in public works project, zero. In private works, you can try to give a better, you have a better luck, and I have had better luck in limiting it or making it more specific and at least carving out um, carving out provisions. Anti-indemnity states, I mean, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but uh, I guess I'll just say, that, yeah, in states like California, there are provisions that I, don't, I wouldn't call them anti-indemnity, but definitely provisions that limit scope of indemnities. So certainly be aware of the, what the, I mean, rather than having an indemnity clause that contains, it contains uh, circumstances that are arguably void or illegal in your particular state, to the extent you can try to negotiate them out, that's, it's easier. It's just easier to deal with everything on the front end, in my experience. Okay, thanks. Um, if I get paid late, but I already gave the prime a release, can I sue them for prompt payment penalties? I got paid late, but I already gave the prime a release of your own. No. Question's a little bit vague, but if you got, if you gave this, well, so I think what you're saying is I gave I gave this the prime a release saying that I got paid. Can I later sue the sub the prime if in fact I gave the release without being paid? That's the question. I think the answer is yes because you effectively gave the release, assuming or conditioned upon the fact that you would get payment, and if that condition ever happened, then you would argue release is invalid. I hope I interpreted that question correctly, but if I did, that's my answer. Okay. What can a subcontractor do to avoid forced mediation and no arbitration or litigation clauses? That's all. So what can a subcontractor do to avoid forced mediation and, I'm sorry, what was the last part? No arbitration or litigation clauses. Um, okay. So forced mediation, I mean, Basically, if you don't want to, if, if, well, first of all, again, assuming you negotiate out that in the contract, if you, if there's a mediation clause and you don't want to do it, you can basically refuse to go to mediation. And then if you are the party that has a claim to assert, you can proceed and file a lawsuit or arbitration and just argue why it's not enforceable or why it doesn't matter. Frankly, you know, I, I think a lot of judges view a mediation, pre-mediation clauses as kind of a check the box. So if the parties don't want to go to it, there's really no sense to make them go to it. So um, that's not a that's more of a practical answer than a than a you know legal answer, I suppose. Uh, in the last, the second part of that was what if there's no arbitration and requires litigation. Uh, the answer is that there's not an arbitration provision. You cannot force the party to go to arbitration. Arbitration is can only be enforced if there's a contract calling for arbitration. The flip side, though, if there's an arbitration clause in the contract and you don't want to arbitrate and you don't want to go to litigation, you can bring a lawsuit, uh, the lawsuit under the contract and then deal with sometimes maybe the other side doesn't want to go to arbitration either. And once you're submitted to the jurisdiction of the court, you have waived your arbitration clause. The other side wants to enforce the arbitration clause. It would be his or her burden to compel you to go to arbitration. Okay. Next question. Um, how about mobility charges on a contract? Mobility to be paid by a certain percent of the contract is completed. That's part one of the question. Well, I, I assume mobility means moving and demobbing, but I'm not exactly sure. But if that's what it means, the contract certainly can specify certain provisions and what you have to do to pay. That would be no dimmer different than, you know, we're going to pay you based on percentage work done in a particular time period. So um, I, I don't, I'm not really sure what the question is, but 
the contract can clearly specify a time period when you get paid. It can be by a certain you know period of time every 30 days. It can say that you'll get paid a certain percentage based on completion of work. So it could also state you'll get paid, you know, certain dollars uh, uh, for, for the for mobilization, if that's if that's a, or demobilization, if that's the question. Okay. The second part was um, retention percent on invoices. How do we know when to keep adding it on the invoices? So retention. Um, it's going to be in the contract. It's going to be typically five or ten percent. You keep on taking dealing with retention until the project is complete, and until you are released, uh, until you get a you get final completion. I would keep on. I would keep on withholding retention until the very end of the project. You will get you will get um, requests for a release of partial retention all the way through, unless the contract says so. You have no obligation to release any part of the retention until the project is complete. Got it. Okay. Um, there are several others, but um, I know we've gone about 15 minutes over. And Mark's email address is there if you'd like to email him. But also, I wanted to let everyone know if we didn't get to your question, there is the level set community space you can go to and post your question there. And um, construction attorneys in your state can see it on there and possibly answer your question through there. Great, thanks right. for having me, Catherine.